what would happen if every human being on Earth disappeared? This isn't the story of how we might vanish. It is the story of what happens to the world we leave behind. In this episode of Life After People, man's most precious metals. How will gold prove its worth in a future without humans? Can the properties of steel protect it from its arch enemies? And what does a mysterious gold mineral have to do with bringing down the dinosaurs? Structures from an age of steel will be changed forever. Welcome to Earth. Population zero. The great cities of mankind were built on metal, financed by gold, constructed of steel. In the absence of man, these metals seem well armored in the battle for survival. But what properties will allow some to crumble and others to last? One day after people. In the heart of Manhattan, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York still guards the vast wealth of depositors who will never return to claim it. It holds more than half a million gold bars worth roughly $200 billion. The accumulated wealth of some 60 foreign governments and central banks. There is more gold in the basement of the Federal Reserve Bank in Manhattan than has been gathered any other place on Earth and any other time in history. The gold is stored 80 feet below street level. The narrow opening to the vault is protected by a rotating 90-ton steel cylinder that forms an air and watertight seal with the surrounding 140-ton steel and concrete frame. The gold lasts pretty much forever. The whole point of having gold is that it doesn't corrode and doesn't tarnish. And there's nothing in nature that can dissolve gold. Gold is one of the most non-reactive metals on Earth. So when it's exposed to air or water, its molecules resist disintegration. But other metals in New York City won't fare so well. Uptown from the Federal Reserve Bank, the steel canyon walls of Times Square are still a glittering urban shrine. But the streets have turned eerily quiet. In the time of humans, it was one of the loudest places in a very loud city. Sustained exposure to sound over 75 decibels was deemed dangerous to human ears. Yet the ambient noise here measured 80 decibels. Honking horns peaked at 90 decibels. And a passing ambulance siren screamed at 120. Now these sounds are silenced, leaving just the 50 decibel hum of thousands of air conditioning units. A world without people would be strangely silent. In many places, the, the dominant sound would be birdsong. Two days after people, the New York City power grid is failing. And so is the trademark glow of hundreds of illuminated signs. These streets have seen blackouts before. In 2003, 
A massive East Coast power outage plunged Times Square into darkness for more than 12 hours. But this time, the blackout is permanent. In the light of day, New York's urban jungle is prowled by creatures unaccustomed to fending for themselves. The horses that once carried police officers and pulled Central Park carriages must adapt to a life with no humans to care for them. In a world of concrete and steel, can these horses survive? 875 miles west of New York City, the breaking point of metal is about to be tested. With a dozen breweries, including Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis was known as America's brewing capital. In the city that once quenched the thirst of a nation and the world, three million kegs worth of beer continue to ferment in several thousand massive steel vats. This is a 30-barrel fermentation tank. It holds 60 kegs of beer. And this is what's inside this tank floating towards the top. It's made of yeast, hot particles, protein, and nitrogen. Inside these fermentation tanks, yeast is used to turn sugars into alcohol. Carbon dioxide is given off as a byproduct, which creates increasing pressure in the tank. If people were gone on day one, the fermentations would go about as normal. As soon as electricity failed and the cooling failed with it, the tanks would begin to rise in temperature. In the St. Louis summer, temperatures can rise over 100 degrees very easily. The heat rising in the brewery will only aggravate these fermentations and make them more and more violent. Automatic safety release valves normally prevent pressure from getting too high in the tank. But fermentation also creates something called croissant, a meringue-like residue which rises to the top of the tank. The extra heat triples the amount of croissant rising to the top of the tank, where it clogs the pressure relief valve. If this were to happen, it could cause a catastrophic failure over the course of 36 hours. In 2009, a fermenting vat explosion tore a 30-foot hole in the roof of a New Orleans brewery. In St. Louis, only 36 hours after people, these violent eruptions blast holes in roofs as they unleash their intoxicating contents in golden flows. Back in New York City, the problem isn't beer, but water. Without power, the 700 pumps that once emptied the subway system of an average of 13 million gallons of water a day are no longer operating. The tunnels are already beginning to flood. It's six months after people. New York City is dark, except for a strange glow in Times Square. Installed in 2009, this illuminated beacon of the human past is a billboard that doesn't rely at all on the municipal power grid. 90% of the sign's power is generated by 16 wind turbines. The rest comes from an array of 64 solar panels the sign's power plant generates enough electricity to power six houses for a year. The turbine's blades were designed to resist freezing in winter and to automatically slow in the face of hurricane force winds to prevent damage. The sign should keep glowing for years, unless something unexpected happens. After people, 
The plaza at Rockefeller Center in Midtown Manhattan is still a gathering place. Only now, it's animals that congregate here. One of the changes that would take place in New York if people were out of the way is that the native animals would move back in. There are already a tremendous population of deer in the suburbs of New York. You may see deer right in the heart of the city. In the time of humans, this concrete chasm was a plaza that transformed into an artificial ice rink every Christmas. This winter, Mother Nature provides her own ice. What would happen is water would freeze during the winter on the rink area itself and would pile up. Uh, and during the spring, uh, the little iceberg would melt and continue to add to the water underneath the buildings themselves. And that would begin to deteriorate the foundation. In the springtime, the sunken plaza becomes like a giant flower pot. The ice rink would definitely become a garden early. It would be wet more of the year, and that's good for growth. Lording over this urban garden is the statue of Prometheus, a figure from Greek mythology credited with creating mankind. He now presides over the destruction of what man has created. The Prometheus statue itself would uh, survive very, very nicely. It's bronze. It's gilded. And for the first five or 10 years, the gold gilding on top of it would continue to shine. That's what gold does. But it's a very, very thin layer. The rain, the hail, the dust that blows around would eventually scour it down to the original bronze. One year after people, the slow decay progresses in silence. But soon, the sounds of crashing steel and stone from above will turn Manhattan into an island of destruction. And something in their bones will bring down the dinosaurs. into a life after people. Every street corner in New York City is dark, except for one. But the wind and solar power billboard in Times Square finally flickers out. It's not for lack of power, just a simple matter of having nobody to change the light bulbs. Meanwhile, the survivors of the urban horses that once patrolled Times Square and pulled tourists around Central Park have fled the city. But can they possibly survive for long in a life after people? The horse is an animal of the plains. It's largely a grass eater. And what's more, its escape mechanism from predation is largely to run. It's also a pretty good fighter if it needs to be. So the horses here in New York City, they have the potential to go wild again, but they need certain things. They need grass. They need open space to run. The golf courses are going to look great. All those suburban yards around New York. But soon, the yards and golf courses will turn into forests, which don't provide the grassy grazing environments that horses need. In order to survive, these horses need to find a suitable habitat in a hurry. Surprisingly, their best bet is to head for the beach. The grassy barrier islands of the Atlantic coast have already proven their ability to sustain herds of wild horses. In the time of humans, several hundred of them made their home on Assateague Island, just off the coast of Virginia and Maryland, the descendants of horses brought here by man 300 years earlier. No 
reason why there shouldn't be wild horses on Long Island as well. But it's a question of are the horses, if the police horses or other horses that escape, are they going to find those places in time? Ten years after people, one of the most unusual steel structures, the Gateway Arch, still stands along the Mississippi River in St. Louis. Little changed from the day humans last packed its observation deck high above the river. At 63 stories, it is the tallest structure in the city, and it might prove to be the longest lasting. Although it's said the architect Eero Saarinen designed it to stand for a thousand years, its slender form looks vulnerable in a life after people. Unlike a skyscraper, the arch doesn't have a steel skeleton. Its strength is derived from double walls of stainless steel plates filled with concrete. Stainless steel corrodes at a very, very slow rate. The surface of the stainless steel is covered with a film of chromium oxide that can resist corrosion for decades. If people suddenly died off, I think it would probably stand for a long time. There's no water intrusion into the structure at all. With no water getting inside of it and no rust forming, there'd really be no reason why anything would, would happen to the structure itself. The arch remains as the gateway to the west, at least for now. At Rockefeller Center, the walls of the buildings have undergone a strange transformation. The seams between the blocks of the limestone that coats all these buildings, those seams would catch a lot of seeds and a lot of dirt. And even uh, 20 or 30 years out, you would probably see a green grid begin to spread out over these buildings. Plants have already shown a relentless drive to colonize places in New York where they were never supposed to be. This is the High Line, an elevated railroad track that runs for 22 blocks along Manhattan's west side. It was completed in 1934, allowing trains to make pickups and deliveries directly inside warehouses and factories, from the meatpacking district to Hell's Kitchen. But rail traffic declined in the 1950s, as more cargo was being transported by truck. The last trains rumbled along parts of this line in 1980. Here you have a structure that's predominantly steel. It's in Manhattan but nobody walked on it, nobody paid any attention to it, except for the wildlife and the wild plants of the city. This ribbon of wilderness high above the city streets is proof that the Big Apple will turn green very quickly in the absence of humans. Thirty-five years after people. The mansion-lined beaches along West Hampton, a Long Island getaway for New York's rich and famous, no longer provide an escape from the troubles of the city. The opulent homes were always perched precariously on the sea. Many houses were even built on the barrier islands that separated the mainland from the pounding Atlantic surf. In the 1990s, a series of Atlantic storms breached the barrier island at West Hampton, destroying many homes. After that, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers rebuilt the barrier island and made sure it was constantly fortified by dredging sand from the sea bottom to build up and reinforce the beach. Right now, we're on the dredge, and we can see the drag head, which is actually very similar to a vacuum cleaner head. It just vacuums up the sand off the ocean bottom. 
sand slurry is pumped from the dredge onto the beach. When it gets onto the beach, it is reshaped by earth moving equipment on the beach. Every four years, the Army Corps pumped up to one million cubic yards of sand onto the beach. Now, without the Herculean effort of humans, the mansions of the rich and famous fall victim to the waves. If there were no humans to do some beach nourishment projects, we expect that tens of thousands of houses would be damaged and the low-lying areas of Long Island would be flooded. after people. Dinosaur skeletons remain standing as relics of a time long before humans walked the earth. Their metal armatures have kept them upright for decades, but there's a disease growing in their bones. It's called pyrite disease, named for the mineral pyrite, also known as fool's gold. It forms during the fossilization process as bacteria trigger a chemical reaction that replaces soft tissue with hard crystals. Fool's gold is one of the common minerals that forms around decaying organisms and that we find around fossils. A lot of the fossils I work on are literally golden in color. If fossils are kept under the right conditions, the pyrite inside remains stable. But in the presence of humid air, the mineral reacts with oxygen and expands. These growing crystals crack the bones from within. In 1999, the Triceratops skeleton, which had been on display at the Smithsonian Institution for almost 100 years, had to be dismantled and conserved, its bones ravaged by this disease. Only half a century after people in the world's great natural history museums, the reign of the dinosaurs is coming to an end. High above New York City, the stainless steel crown of the Chrysler Building still shimmers. In the time of humans, the building's low-maintenance steel only had to be cleaned twice in a span of 76 years. On the 61st floor, eight stainless steel eagle gargoyles keep watch over the city, constantly buffeted by high-level winds. The Chrysler Building is particularly exposed to the wind because there's not a lot of tall buildings to the east of it. The gargoyles are not really fastened super tightly to the structure of the building. They're an add-on. They're basically bolted into place. Its connection to the building corroded. One of the wingless eagles takes its first and final flight. Around the world, the sounds of crashing steel and stone become more frequent as the years go by. It's a reality that is already tearing apart this once thriving spot in the Nevada desert, whose founders intended it to rival the city of Chicago. And it's soon to be a reality in our great cities, where some structures have a surprising flaw that can kill them before their time. after people is enough to ravage even cities that were built to last. It's a future that has already happened in this mysterious site. While modern cities are built on steel, this one lived and died by gold. This is Rhyolite, Nevada, a former gold mining town located 120 miles from Las Vegas. 
in the unforgiving desert landscape near Death Valley. When gold fever struck the Nevada mountains in 1904, Rhyolite's population of two miners jumped to 1,200 people in just six months. Some found great success. In its first three years, the largest mine in the area produced over $1 million in gold, the equivalent of more than $24 million today. These riches fueled the construction of a town that the city fathers hoped would rival Chicago. By 1908, there were as many as 8,000 residents. This is the Rhyolite Railroad Depot. It was built in 1908, and it's one of the first things that people would see when they would come into the town. Standing here today, this quiet ghost town, you can almost hear the sound of that coal-powered steam engine coming up the hill, the black smoke pouring out the coal stack. And as the people disembark onto the steps of the station, you could almost hear their excited shouts and cries as they come down to visit what they hope is going to be a golden future. Despite the early promise of the mines, much of the most valuable ore in the area proved too difficult to extract, and a nationwide financial crisis dried up the capital needed to sustain the hunt for gold. By 1910, the boom was over. The town was left to die. Rhyolite may look like a classic Old West ghost town, but the structures here tell a unique story. This is the Cook Bank Building, once the crown jewel of Rhyolite. It guarded over $200,000 of hard-earned wealth, which would be the equivalent of roughly $4 million today. In its prime, the bank had marble stairs and stained glass windows. It was built right at the peak of Rhyolite during the boom time, and this whole valley was covered with houses and cabins and tents. If it had been built of wood, like most structures of the era, the walls would have collapsed long ago. But this was one of the earliest multi-story buildings in the West to be constructed of reinforced concrete, a technique that had then been in use for only 15 years in the United States. Built to last, the concrete has stood tall against the ravages of time. But time is running out. When you look at these buildings like this, all this massive concrete structure is only 100 years later, and we're sitting here looking at a shell of a building that's crumbling to the dust. Another 100 years from now, this building will be nothing but gravel and sand. The enemy in Death Valley isn't moisture. This is one of the driest places on Earth. Located in the mountains rather than the valley floor, rhyolite still averages only about six inches of rain per year. What there is plenty of here is wind and sand. The abrasive grinding action of the desert wind is like a sandblasting tool. The particles erode surfaces and penetrate into cracks. The concrete delaminates, causing layers to separate from within, and the structure crumbles. As you can tell, it's a dangerous place. The building has been standing here for 100 years, and if you look up, you'll see that the building is almost ready to topple under its own weight. Man helped nature along in its destruction of rhyolite. People began scavenging wood supports and other useful materials that were scarce in the remote desert. The floor joists were sawed off and removed from the building soon after the building was abandoned. And once the floor joists disappeared, the building surfaces are free to deflect outwards. And with that process in place, the building's integrity is at stake. At the town's general store, where miners once came to buy the tools of their trade, the disappearance of its internal wooden structure has hastened the destruction. Even glass, 
a substance made from sand, is a primary building block in one surviving home. The bottle house was made from 30,000 empty whiskey bottles. Although the house has been restored several times, including in 1925 for use in a silent film, the glass itself is biologically inactive and does not corrode. Rhyolite's ambitious founders hoped to build an enduring metropolis in the desert. Instead, after 90 years, it is on the verge of vanishing off the map. This shows that you can set up a city and it will crumble down and go away within a couple hundred years. A century after people, all cities around the world will take on the look of the abandoned towns of the West. In New York, the skyscrapers are ghostly towers, and a change made in the 1940s will soon determine the strange new shape of the skyline. One hundred years after people, the sound of snapping steel reverberates down the corroded canyons of New York City. The cables of the suspension bridges connecting Manhattan to Brooklyn and Queens are failing. of the Brooklyn Bridge is held up by just over a thousand vertical suspender or hanger cables, each about the thickness of a human wrist. Each cable is made up of seven strands of steel twisted around each other, a total of 100 miles of steel in every cable. The cables are galvanized, covered in a protective coating of zinc which corrodes much more slowly than the underlying steel. This is a wire from an existing or cable from an existing bridge, a hanger cable. And you look at the condition of the cable. You can see the paint is uh, peeling off, and you can see that there are places where there's red rust. That means that the coating on these wires, which are uh, mostly galvanized coating, the galvanizing is failing. And so now you have a wire uh, that's uh, going to rust, and you may have failures uh, by fracture of individual wires. Once you've broken enough of the wires, then you begin to break wires as kind of a cascade. And you'll see them fray, and then the rope will fail. Just upriver from the Brooklyn Bridge, the city's most adventurous commuters once relied on another steel cable structure to get them into Manhattan. The only thing holding up the Roosevelt Island tramway is a pair of nearly two inch diameter wire ropes. The weak point is the spot where the cables cross over the steel support towers. Especially where the cable goes across over the saddles and at the terminals, the cable is bent back and forth as the tram goes across it. So you tend to get some fatigue loading in the cables, and that is what actually uses up the life of the cable. In the time of humans, the cables were shifted roughly 100 feet every five years to keep any one point from being in contact with the towers for too long. Now, even though the tram hasn't moved along the cable for 100 years, wind has continued to buffet the tramway, causing stress on the wires near the towers. 
they snap. And the tram car plunges 250 feet into the East River. One hundred fifty years after people, at Rockefeller Center, where humans once had to truck in a tree to celebrate the holiday season, the greenery is now on permanent display. The skyscrapers that made New York famous have transformed into vertical ecosystems. Towards the bottoms of the building, you'll begin to get rubble and soil accumulating. Then you'll get things that like those sort of dry environments things like oak and hickory and a wide variety of grasses. The higher up you go, the more wind you're going to have and the drier it's going to be. So those are places where the plants that colonize the outside of the building are going to be cliff dwellers. 150 years after people signals the beginning of the era of the great building collapses in New York City. Surprisingly, it's the newer buildings that are crumbling the fastest. While the walls of older buildings had to be strong, integral parts of the structure, new types of steel developed in the mid-20th century allowed most of a building's weight to be carried by the inner columns. So most of New York City's post-war skyscrapers were built using a glass and steel curtain wall technique in which the outer walls just form a lightweight protective skin of steel and glass. One of the big complaints New Yorkers have of newer buildings is that they all leak. Well, if they all leak while we're maintaining them, they're all going to leak a lot when we're not maintaining them. And so the most modern buildings would actually go first. It's the buildings that were built up through the 1940s that would last the longest. Two hundred years after people, with the collapse of the modern skyscrapers, New York's silhouette is a throwback to the Great Depression. Both completed in the early 1930s, the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building once vied to be the tallest buildings in the world. The Chrysler held that crown for less than a year before the Empire State surpassed it. Now, the rivalry is over. The Empire State Building slips from the skyline. The Chrysler Building, the first of man's skyscrapers to stand taller than 1,000 feet, is once again the tallest building in the city. As before, its reign won't last for long. The deteriorating columns can no longer support the floors. That's the critical point when a skyscraper becomes on the verge of total collapse. Several columns buckling in a single floor, allowing one floor to descend rapidly to another level below, would be sufficient to trigger a cascading collapse. of New York is now unrecognizable. In fact, very few tall structures remain standing in the cities of the world. One of the exceptions is the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, but a small part added to the structure at the last minute holds the key to its destruction. For 250 years after people, St. Louis's Gateway Arch has worn its stainless steel skin as armor against the dragon's breath of corrosion. 
But stainless steel isn't invincible. It doesn't last forever. The mechanism for final failure will probably be around the center of the arch at the top. That's its thinnest point. The thinnest points are the two sections that form the so-called keystone. They're steel triangles, 17 feet long by 18 feet high. They were the last pieces to be installed. The keystone is so critical to the structure's stability that until it was inserted, a temporary stabilizing truss had to be used to keep the two legs from collapsing. Before the pieces were lifted into place on October 28, 1965, a Roman Catholic priest and a rabbi blessed the keystone. Now the prayers of man are of little help. The keystone buckles and drops from the structure. The two legs of the arch would not be able to stand on their own, and they would fall down to the ground. The first 250 years after people have seen the skylines of our cities crumble, now the ruins will be swallowed up by water, soil, and plants. One thousand years after people, New York skyscraper canyons are now just canyons. Rivers flow where taxi cabs once rolled. Their course is going to follow what used to be the streets and are now these sort of pseudo canyons at the bottom of these strangely shaped hills that are the rubble left of the skyscrapers. years after people. On the New York shoreline wanders a pack of wild horses, the descendants of the urban equines that thousands of years ago protected and entertained the humans of New York City. The high salt content in their seaside food supply means that they have to drink twice as much water as their domesticated ancestors once did. And the grasses here are so deficient in nutrients that the horses have evolved a shorter stature in response to the poor quality of their diet. Still, they have survived. Buried in the ground beneath their feet, a corroding steel crypt holds tight to its precious contents. Once 80 feet below street level, the Federal Reserve Gold Vault is now hundreds of feet underground and inundated with water from rising seas. Inside, the largest stockpile of gold ever assembled on Earth remains well preserved. They're underground. They're encased in steel. Now, steel uh, will be much less happy underground. If you look at archaeological iron steel implements, on the surface they rust. Underground they tend to pit and corrode. Although the steel will eventually corrode, the gold bars themselves should last not just for thousands of years, but even millions. When the future archaeologists find it, they're going to wonder about the culture that built such an amazing temple and sanctuary. The 24 karat gold will live on as a precious metal. Once mined, molded, and guarded by humans, now returned to the earth in a life after people.